Bobby. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, state management, especially how it relates to a system that is very extensible, that is for the most part consisting of stuff that is not part of the core and does not, does not know about each other and um, still has to work without interfering with each other. Yeah, my name is Marijn Havenbeke. If you move in the JavaScript world, you may know me from one of these uh, projects. The thing I'm going to be talking about now mostly is uh, CodeMirror, the uh, a code editor written in JavaScript, open source, that you can insert in a web page to have an editor component with a lot of the features that people expect from a code editor uh, nowadays. So one thing about code editors uh, that is very important is that they need to be extendable. That, um, well, I mean, it depends on the context, of course, but even in something like a standalone code editor like VS Code, a lot of the value people get from it is custom extensions that they add to fit whatever they're doing. And if you are writing a component, a library that people are going to embed in, who knows what kind of systems, it's even more important that it uh, can do new things that were not anticipated in the core. So it's using, uh, Codemary is using a setup where very little is part of the actual required core of the library. And um, even stuff like the undo, undo history or syntax highlight are extensions working on uh, the same API that third-party code can work on, so that you can replace basically everything and do everything that the core does in your third-party code. That, of course, comes with its own uh, kind of challenges. Another thing that uh, is typical for code editors is that there's lots of interdependent state, like all these extensions are going to have some state, application state that they track which is usually at least dependent on what the document currently is. Every time the document changes, they all have to update something uh, usually uh, so that whatever they're tracking still matches the current uh, document, as well as other parts of the uh, state, like the selection. And state transitions come in a lot of different flavors. Like there's no fixed small set of things that can happen to update the editor state. Even just the basic stuff that the user can do uh, comes in a lot of flavors. They can type something, they can move the selection, they can undo, redo, pick a completion, whatever. And uh, extensions are going to add even more state transition flavors to this. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that poses some new challenges. If you go for the naive, classical, at least in the JavaScript world, model of uh, tracking in the dependent state, you have the different sub-programs track their own state and you somehow wire them together so that when one thing changes the others kind of follow after that. Usually with something like event handlers, like the uh, browser interface, for example, uh, even the Node.js interface, these are all very heavy on the event handlers, which are imp imperative things that Something happened, you can register that you want to know if it happened, and then you're told and you react to that at some more or less specified point in time after uh, the thing happened. But of course, once you have a bunch of interdependent pieces of state, which may have more dependencies between them in a kind of direct acyclic graph structure, um, doing this like step by step in an imperative way, um, even if you rigorously register your event handlers between them, means that you have observable inconsistent state because stuff updates in an order and uh, at the point where not everything has updated yet, some of these pieces of state in the different sub-programs will be out of sync. And if you access them in the meantime, you'll get uh, problems. Um, so, for example, you have here the core library, which ma maintains a document and a selection. You have the parser, which ma maintains a parse tree, and you have the highlighter, which uses the tree and the document to assign colors to different pieces of the document. 
Uh, document updates and the event handler for the highlighter fires and um, it's reached from the parse tree but for some reason those were registered in an order where the parse tree hasn't updated yet and this becomes really awkward to reason about um, conceptually you can kind of see it as uh, you have your state on a piece of paper and when something happens you just scratch something out and write over it what the new state is and at any point the old piece of paper is still there and in the process of being updated. Where, of course, um, coming from a functional perspective, what you want is you start a new piece of paper and you write your whole new state in a rigorous, uh, disciplined way where um, you know that everything in the new state is updated and uh, coherent with uh, the rest of what happened. So what we arrived at there uh, as a uh, similar thing that a lot of uh, functional UI uh, systems arrive at is the state is a single persistent immutable value and uh, changing the application state involves computing a new value and swapping it in atomically. So you update one pointer somewhere that says this is the current application state. Before that happened the old state is there and when it happens the whole new state is there in one point. It's not an observable process that uh, leaves an inconsistent state in between. But as I said, this is an extensible system, so we don't just have a static data type for this state which has uh, some fixed fields. We need extensions to be able to define our own uh, fields which are added to each instance of, uh, each instance of the state. Um, and these then of course have to come with their own logic for computing this new value of that uh, state field from the update. That means you want the update to also be represented somewhere. It's not just something that happens, some function that gets called. You need a first class value that describes an update to the application state. This is a long history in, in systems like Elm Redux, where uh, they usually go with something they call actions, which tend to be uh, sometimes like unions of the various things that can happen in the system, possibly with some extra uh, data that describes it. We find that this works really poorly in an extendable system because um, you do not have a fixed set of types of updates. Different extensions can define new things that can happen to the system. And uh, everyone needs to be able to re react to all the kinds of updates that are relevant to them. Um, which is difficult if they are come from like uh, different pieces of the system that don't know about each other. So what we do is a thing that's called a transaction, which is a single data type holding a set of effects, uh, which are things that change the state. So each time something happens, you create a transaction and add, this is open-ended, um, third-party software can define their own effects, export them so that other uh, modules can import them and, and then look at them. I'm not sure why it just jumped, I didn't even touch my computer. Um, and um, So a transaction is a set of these effects and um, the update logic for each piece of the state can observe the effects that it's interested in and ignore all the other effects so they can handle all kinds of transactions that may be generated by who knows what software and uh, pick out the parts that are relevant to them and, and respond to them appropriately. The fact that um, the state, uh, the new state is a pure function of the old state and the transaction is, is really, really useful allows a kind of reasoning about what's going to happen with your state uh, that uh, a system where things move through an opaque web of events really do not provide. Um, it allows you to, to take a snapshot of your state by just storing an old, uh, an old state object. It allows you to compare two states by you have both of those objects and you look, uh, is this field different or what else changed? Um, of course, it also has a cost, especially in JavaScript land, which is not a language that is known for its super robust 
uh, support for pure functions and immutable data structures. It's um, also culturally, it is rather uh, quite a step for many people programming against this system to actually formulate their stuff in a way where uh, they don't mutate their old state. Um, but often, these kind of things, like for example, the document structure in this editor. Um, okay, this is really strange. <laughs> I don't know what could be touching my computer to do things, but um, yeah, um, we'll see. Um, right, the document structure it is a tree which uh, reuses most of its uh, structure when you update a small part of the document. And um, often these kind of things have other advantages as well, like you need some kind of advanced data structure for your document as well if you want to support multiple megabyte size uh, content efficiently and um, yeah though it is it is an investment it, it pays off in most of the uh, corners where we did it because it just uh, makes other things easier so now each field uh, like these little things that uh, can be extended that are added to the state provides a similar thing where um, the field is updated by a function from its old value and the transaction. Simply speaking, in fact, um, like often these fields also need, as we saw also in the, the diagram for the, for the, for the uh, event-based system at the start, uh, often these need to access the value of other fields, which these inputs don't provide them. Um, now, one way to do that would be to actually have them explicitly declare the dependencies and then topologically sort them in the ideal order to compute them so that uh, the ones with no dependencies go first and so on, and then you feed them the value of the dependencies, but that's kind of awkward to program against, so what we're doing is a kind of slate of hand, where um, the value of a field in a new state takes the new state as an argument. Um, so that's kind of circular, but it can be made to work pretty easily uh, by just allocating the state first with its fields initialized, uninitialized, and then just start initializing them one by one. Um, and as, as the logic for initializing a field accesses another field, you eagerly compute that so that. Um, they just naturally get computed in the order in which they are required. Uh, and by the time the state is initialized, you've uh, computed all those fields. So we track for each field uh, states initialized, uninitialized, or initializing, so that if you somehow end up in a state where there's a cyclic dependency, someone is going to access a field that's initializing, and you can raise an error because we do not support cyclic data flow within the fields. It doesn't actually come up, but it's nice to be uh, secure against it. Um, the fact that states are static, predictable things mean that um, they also carry with them a configuration, which describes the set of fields that they must uh, carry. So um, when you initialize your initial editor state, you provide a bunch of extensions to it, which are distilled into just the configuration of the state shape. And then on every update that carries this state, uh, this shape along to the next state. And um, one thing we found that we needed to support is a dynamic reconfiguration where um, during the lifetime of an editor state, you change the set of, you want like the user picks a new extension that they want to uh, enable. You don't want to throw everything away that you already have, say your undo history or uh, whatever. So, um, yeah, there we go again. Um, in that case, if you reconfigure the state, which is also done through a transaction, computes a new set of fields and uh, just preserves the value of the fields that is still in the new configuration, throws away the ones that are deleted and initializes from this new state uh, the uh, fields that are added to the new state. So um, each field also comes with an initializer which takes a current state and determines the uh, value of that field in this initial state. 
this is again using this uh, lazy initialization logic, which allows us to provide a state object even though the initial the fields inside of it haven't all finished initializing. Um, of course, living in uh, the browser uh, with its very event and imperative uh, mutation driven uh, API means that a lot of the system is imperative. So the question is, is it actually <coughs> worth to try and impose this kind of functional structure on a system like this? Our experience is that it really is. Um, there's ghosts here, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, what's it listening to? I just the click so maybe it click Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, that, uh, despite part of the system being very imperative, it still provides uh, a lot of really useful structure to have at least this part of your program, the state management, which is often where things go wrong and which definitely helps when things go wrong to figure out what is going wrong, to have that all be uh, purely functional. So the way it works in practice is you have the, the editor view, which is a user interface component which has a given editor state and renders the code uh, and the editor to the screen, manages the selection. When the user does something to this interface, it, it converts that into a transaction. It's called dispatching in the system. You dispatch a transaction, it means compute a new state from this transaction and the current state, swap that state into the view component and then have that synchronize itself to this new state. It also has access to the transaction so that it's easy at that point to see exactly what has happened and it can do things like it only needs to redraw the codes that actually changed and um, basically minimize the amount of work it's doing uh, because it knows exactly what happened. Incremental updating is a big thing in these kind of systems because um, you do not want, there's lots of derived data, like say the syntax tree or uh, the uh, location of lint warnings and stuff like that. You do not want to compute that from scratch on every keystroke because an editor has to be relatively uh, quick to respond and um, it's really annoying if your key presses take 150 milliseconds or something. Um, so what we do is, uh, for example, the parse tree, there's a whole incremental parser system which looks at the transaction, exactly uh, knows exactly what changes, usually changes are tiny, and then sets up a new parse of the document using as much of the old structure as possible. Uh, it's, there's, uh, it's a whole uh, subfield as well, it's, it's possible to do robust incremental parsing where you actually still have the correct tree that you would have get gotten if you parsed from scratch by reusing a lot of work that was already done in a parse for a very similar document. UI updates both in the uh, core uh, editor view and, and in a lot of the extensions also make sure to only do the minimal work needed uh, to get things synchronized to the new state. So the principles as far as state management that we uh, ended up with is that it's really, really useful to have a single immutable value represent your entire application state. I'm not sure if that always generalizes to bigger applications, but for uh, at least a component like this, it's, uh, yeah, there's no doubt that this works really well. That state holds a set of fields which is extendable. Um, there's no like this is going to be very different in different setups and that's okay and the system handles it. It's uh, updated atomically so you never see uh, inconsistent state. Change, changes in the state are described by a thing called the transaction which is a set of effects. Again, a set, having sets of things is really great for uh, open-ended extendable systems where you don't know in advance what exactly is going to flow through a part of the program. And it's really important that the transaction describes the entire change, like nothing else changes except what is described as being changing in the transaction. 
And that is the only way to update uh, the application state. So now you know there's a single code path that's uh, going to be handling all the state updates. And there's no other side channels where uh, weird things might be happening. So that, uh, yeah, during debugging, it's very, very helpful uh, to be able to tap into that and see exactly why the state is changing. And um, this kind of thing is composable in that the different plugins or extensions don't really step on each other's toes. They can work with changes generated by other third-party uh, extensions that they never heard of reliably, uh, even though uh, they aren't aware of their existence. And um, these update functions, like reducers they're often called in uh, Redux or other systems, they, um, they tend to be relatively simple and describe the entire logic that is needed to update some piece of state. So that, um, yeah, it's easy to construct things that uh, keep the whole uh, application state between the uh, different uh, submodules consistent by construction. It's not, uh, you don't have to do a lot of complicated work, it's just if you follow uh, the recipe here, it uh, is likely to be correct. Um, some examples of how uh, this is actually used in the code editor are, um, for example, the undo history. As I said, it's not in core, it's an extension which observes transactions that modify the document and stores the inverse of the change they made. There's also a kind of uh, operational transform and, and uh, algebra of changes in the system which allows you to invert changes and uh, compose them, stuff like that. Um, so it um, stores the inverted changes, groups them together by some logic, which again it can observe from the transactions of how close in time together and the space together these changes are, whether to treat them as a single and do event or not. And then when the, uh, so this is a state field holding these, kind of stack of events, each of them uh, telling you oh, what to do to invert the event. Um, when the user undoes, you take the top event, uh, apply those changes in your transaction, as well as add another effect in the transaction which says pop off the top uh, event from the undo history so that it doesn't treat it like a normal change and like duplicates it onto its own history. There's uh, a bit more to it because we also support um, changes that aren't added to the history so then you have to like you're not just rolling back to a previous document shape, you have to maybe move um, these old changes over some changes that didn't get undone, which is uh, a different topic. Uh, we're using a form of operational transformation where you basically take two changes that happened in this order and then define how they would look if they were happen in the other order. It's also used for collaborative editing, which I'll get back to in a second. Um, but uh, yeah, it's again also something that's supported by the undo history where you, for example, uh, make some change that you don't want the user to be able to undo. You can set a flag and say, uh, this is not undoable, don't store it as normal. Another feature would be like a linter, where um, linting is usually done by external tools where um, you have your code editor on the one side and a library that takes a piece of text in a given language and then spits out a sequence of warnings or errors uh, about that code. So that's kind of uh, in this system disconnected from the uh, editor where if you're idle for a second or like a given amount of time, it takes the current document, feeds it to the lint logic, gets back synchronously or asynchronously uh, a set of uh, warnings or errors. And then um, at this point, uh, I, I forgot to mention before, uh, in this um, extensions can also define a imperative part which lives in this kind of view component, which is used for things like uh, asynchronous actions, drawing user interfaces, re re reacting to button presses and stuff like that. Um, 
So for example, the linter, if uh, it, it has its own imperatively running piece which observes editor updates, and uh, if it knows that it needs to relint and nothing has happened for a while, it asynchronously starts a lint process. When it finishes, it dispatches a transaction saying, okay, we add uh, a bunch of lint errors to the editor state, and um, draw these as like little squiggly underlines or something in a document, maybe also uh, add a gutter uh, showing them. Um, but then, because these are not kept in sync with the document changes, when documents continues to change, these lint errors have to kind of be mapped to their new position in the document, because uh, like the user might be typing inside of them, deleting them entirely, stuff like that. And until an excellent pass happens, they have to be consistent with where, the where they currently are in the document. That's a, a concept that happens a lot in editors, is mapping positions from where they were before a change to where they were after a change, so that you can continue to track your data structures um, in relation to the current document. Collaborative editing is another thing that's uh, an extension. So basically, uh, what you want to do is continuously synchronize the content of your editor with the content of some other editor possibly running on a, a, a different machine over the network. Um, how that works is um, the editor, the, the extension adds a state field that tracks changes that have happened locally but have not been synced yet. So there's a server that you can push changes to and um, if your version of the document corresponds to the version of the server, it accepts them and says, okay, yeah, those are now part of the canonical document that other people can see. If you're behind me, you try to push changes and says, no, uh, you're out of sync, try again later. And you're also continuously fetching changes that other people might be making from that server. So um, what the extension on the client does, it's tracking changes that haven't been synchronized yet. And it's constantly polling the server for uh, new changes. And um, when changes from other peers come in, it moves those locally made changes that have been ha made from document version A, which is also the, like it's the version that you know the server has. So when new changes come in from the server, those also start at document version A. When you have those concurrent sets of changes, you move your own changes forward over the remote changes so that they apply to document version B, which is the one that is uh, current after the remote changes. And then you continue trying to uh, submit your changes to the server, which will eventually accept them, causing the whole system to eventually uh, co uh, reach a consistent document across the client. Um, it's really fun to be able to do all this kind of stuff insert party code. It also, for example, there's an other implementation of collaborative editing based on YJS, which is a, a CRDT system, um, which works completely different than operational transform, but serves the same purpose and uh, can also be used as an implementation uh, for this kind of thing, uh, because it's not wired into the core. That's all I had to say. Uh, I'm pretty quick it seems, but uh, that means more time for questions. Um, this here is the project's website and the other one is uh, if you want to see more of the stuff I write and build. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, can you make a comparison to how other editors uh, do that sort of concept, having different modules that can access the state? Is that a very unique model that you have here, uh, or is it uh, now I copied? I think in editor space it might be quite unique. I'm um, not actually that aware of what, for example, uh, Code is doing at the moment, but I know it doesn't look anything like that because they have very much designed their system from a monolith and then kind of made it reusable after the fact. Um, uh, it's also definitely very different from uh, what, for example, Emacs does, which is 
mutable everything and we have a shared space of variables where we're all kind of fetching them and then some interfaces are designed so that extensions can cooperate, sometimes it goes catastrophically bad. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this is definitely a space where a lot of the existing tools aren't that great yet and I'm hoping to move the state of the art forward with it. Anything else? Um, how did you first come up with this uh, architecture? Did you naturally uh, arrive there? Did you take inspiration from like existing projects, or did you struggle a lot, experiment with things, and eventually ended up like this? I uh, took a lot of. Uh, inspiration from Redux and Elm uh, for sure um, and a lot of this was prototyped in, in ProgeMirror which is another project that I'm working on doing rich text kind of uh, editor uh, component um, there they were yeah that was kind of the first iteration I'm not super happy with it and then I tried to do it right the second iteration on this project you want another question? Um, a lot of problems that you describe some of the like problems that uh, or that are being solved by databases as well. And I wonder if you consider using a database as a sort of a banking store for uh, yeah for the state. Yeah, um, that's definitely true. There is uh, like uh, yeah, definitely um, a lot of overlap with with what databases do. Um, the thing about most database setups is that they throw away the old state as you update the state, which is uh, something I didn't want here. Um, though you can, of course, there are all, but yeah, uh, this is a library that's trying to keep its weight within reason. So there's also definitely a concern of uh, doing the simplest thing that can work so that we don't build megabytes of code uh, that people have to download because in JavaScript, every client has to actually download it. On the way, I have another question. Yes. Um, your transactions, are they categorized by type or by subject? Well, one time you know, they're just generic bags of effects. And uh, there is one tag that you can add called user event, where you want to say, uh, is this something typical that the user does? And then there's a little hierarchy of typing, deleting, selecting, typing. Uh, with subtype composing, typing with sub or deleting with subtype, deleting the selection. So that, uh, for example, if you're implementing autocompletion and you want to uh, update, like starts completion when user types, but not when they paste. So you don't just need to see the document change, but you want to see some user intent. So there's there is one tag uh, that is used for stuff like that. I, I came on this question when talking about the undo history and then you said that uh, the extension uh, listens to everything that changes the document and that could be a category yeah or if, if another if another transaction is implemented in the system you but might need to uh, add that to the but the everything that changes the document is just every transaction that has a document changing effect so that's kind of falls out naturally it's just uh, so you can identify the transactions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so one quick question about the origins of this architecture. Um, does it come from the idea of having an extensible editor with many extensions uh, you know, changing the state, or was it with collaborative editing in mind? No, it mostly comes from the, the, the requirements of having lots of extensions and uh, yeah, having them. Rely like the the. I recently rewrote this whole system uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was on version five, which is very much uh, jQuery era uh, event system driven uh, architecture, and some things like for example uh, the the thing where this was the worst was uh, a merge view where you have two editors side by side showing a different version of the document and displaying the changes. Um, just keeping 
like the logic showing those changes in sync as uh, those editors were being acted on was a royal headache in this event-driven architecture because there would be so many things that could happen that would all need to be accounted for. And um, yeah, that kind of thing drove kind of this, uh, we want a single point where things happen and not multiple points so that it's much easier to do this kind of ambitious extension which really needs to stay 100% in sync with uh, what is happening. Another one? So it cool. seems like the changes are not backwards compatible. Yeah. No, this is... So you have to update and the third party extensions have to be updated as well. Yes. Yeah. Is that yeah. hard in your experience? Yeah, it's given a bunch of... Like it's not something where you have to upgrade. A lot of people are still using uh, the old library, but uh, it's definitely... Uh, it's some effort to upgrade, but the, the people tend to be happy for the same reasons that... Uh, this was started in that their system becomes less dodgy after Where you have the support. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much.